everybody. Um, my name is Noelle. I'm the director of marketing and events for the Graph, Edge of Node, and the House of Web 3. We're really excited to have you all here today. The House of Web 3 is a first of its kind co-creation space for those in Web3. So we welcome you to take a look at our website. You can go to edgeandnode.com and click on House of Web3 um, and request an invitation if you're interested in joining and co-creating here during the day. And we have tons of events here, three to five probably a week um, that we love to share. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Lisa, who put this amazing event together today. Thank you, Noelle. Thanks everyone for coming to our second Art in Web3 event. Um, tonight we're focused on generative art and we have a great um, selection of speakers here to present to you tonight. Um, starting, we have uh, Jordan Cantor from Artblocks and Carolina DeBartolo, who's an artist, uh, Rob Dixon, who's also an artist, and Martin Grasser, who's also an artist. Um, there's a couple other artists in the audience too, uh, Jeff Palmer and Johan, and we're also showing Santiago's work. And then we also have um, Han from DECA, also known as Bonafide Han, who will be speaking with Jordan in the second half of the talks this evening. Um, I also wanted to thank Clara's Auction Gallery for sponsoring tonight. Um, where's Talisa? There's Talisa. Thank you so much for sponsoring this event tonight. And then um, the event will be recorded by exhibited.at. Um, it's a local resident founder, Rodanya, is um, the founder of exhibited.at. So look out for that. Um, so we have, there's a gallery throughout the space, and there's eight screens. So there's maps everywhere posted that you can see which art is where. And um, we have live minting in the entryway, as well as um, Martin Grasser's type generator to play around with. And um, there are POAPs too. So make sure you check out everything after. And with that, I will let Martin take it away. Thank you. Well, I'll take it before Martin gets it. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no problem. Um, I'm Jordan Cantor. I'm the artistic director at Artblocks. And thank you all for coming. And thank you, Lisa. And thank you to the House of Web3 for hosting this. Um, we're delighted to have a community event that can focus on generative art and how the blockchain is supporting that and making it possible for us to kind of experience a new art form and see new things from uh, the amazing creators here and in the room too. Uh, so thanks for your interest and for coming. Um, my job as artistic director at Artblocks is really um, to screen projects for release on the platform. They're all generative on-chain projects. Uh, I work with a, a committee that makes those decisions. And then um, we support the artists as they're in our ecosystem and developing their code and uploading that code onto the blockchain. And then we support their release. And then thereafter, we sort of advocate for them in the world and for this movement that we believe in. And one of my main approaches to that is to get out of the artist's way as much as possible. And um, that's basically the format that we're going to have tonight. We've asked each of these three artists to bring some images in, um, which we'll throw up on the screen, and then really just make space for them to talk about their practice, um, some of the projects that they've already released, what generative art means to them, and how they're productively using the blockchain, and then uh, maybe what they're working on and what's coming next. So the structure is uh, each of them will have maybe about 10 or 15 minutes to go through a couple slides. I hope that at the end, they would avail themselves to questions. If not, you can ask me questions uh, and I'll try and answer, <laughs> answer them. Uh, but uh, I, my technical knowledge is very low. So, you know, you can ask me aesthetic questions. And then we'll take a little break. And then for the second half, um, uh, as Lisa said, we'll have a conversation with Han. So uh, in the spirit of getting out of the artist's way, I have the clicker here, and I think we're going to start with uh, Marty um, talking about and walking us through a couple projects. And just by way of framing it, can you just start by saying what generative art means to you and how we might see some of those interests in these images? Uh, generative art to me is about um, building systems. I think of design as like putting down a positive like putting something exactly where you want it. And to me, generative design is about uh, 
building a space in which uh, interactions can happen and systems can happen. And so my job during the day is building corporate identity systems, which I love. I, I like seeing how things disseminate into the world. And so to me, this is my abstract version of that where I talk in color or in shape and I build a playground or a construct in which interactions happen and art comes out. And so this to me is like the simplest form because it's one shape. So it's a building upon of squares and talking in color. So the background is made up of 10 million squares to appear like sand. And then on top of that, I build a grid which fills with colors and interactions. And um, I feel like they're little conversations or colors talking. They're meant to be letter forms or sentences that build in Z space. Um, they feel like monospace typography to me in color. And, and so I love the conversation between design and then where you're sort of giving something up to the system uh, and then having to have that conversation back and forth, like working in code, working in an unknown output. And then at a fine, some, some point you have to say this is done and you make 300 and then you have to kind of hate it for a few weeks and then <laughs> learn, learn to love it. <laughs> Do you have to talk? Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> Can you hear him? Anybody who wants to speak up, say speak up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, got it, got it. Can you tell me what, what's the title of the for the folks who don't know? Squares. What's the title of the project? What's the edition size? And it was maybe it's what's called Squares. Yeah. And it literally is built on the idea of like, I'm a designer, so give me a restraint. Mm -hmm. And so if I all I have to do is fill a square with color and then build an interaction. I think these are pretty good in terms of that constraint. So there's 196 of them, so they can be displayed in a square because I want them to be available. Yeah. And uh, I don't know what else to say. There's uh, 30 color palettes, and it took 11 months to build this. And it started with a picture of um, my kids' toys, magnet tiles. So this oh, was nice. um, floating a camera taking a picture every three seconds, so almost generative photography, taking a picture over kids' magnet tiles that created this blur of color. And then I started building lights and other like colors on top of that, and it started to become an interesting little conversation. And then started to build, you know, they, they get more interesting as I think they build up. <clears throat> I'll never unsee the magnet tiles. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. Great, and so uh, here are just another couple of examples. Um, so the algorithm has some diversity of outputs. Were, were there any it's surprises just... when it was minting? <sighs> no, well, I think, uh, you know, the feedback I actually got was to add more diversity, but I loved the constraint. To me, I was really happy. I, I still, I think 196 turned out to be a great size. And uh, I think that there's just enough of each of them. And I think there's just enough like chunky ones and skinny ones and ones where, parts of the image disappear. And I, this goes back to what I said. I think it's like anyone who makes art or I guess makes anything, you make food and like you want to criticize, like how oh, would I do different? And I think that when it came out, I was, I don't know, you just kind of don't know how to react. Then you kind of learn to be like, I'm so appreciative of how this ended up. Cause it's just like a whatever, I don't know, 45 minutes of a day and people press a button and then you end up with art. It's really romantic yeah. or kind of cool. I love it. I don't know. And you're stuck with these. And then some people trade them for nothing. And <laughs> I love the market. You know, I think it's interesting to watch them get whipped around and stuff. And so I'm also like, I, I think it's part of my job. And excuse me if this is like too basic or something. But I always want to bring things down to a common denominator just so that we're all having the same conversation. So I feel like some operative definition is needed here for a second. So yeah. for this project, he uploads an algorithm that can run an output that he doesn't see in advance, okay? So he uploads that code onto the blockchain. Then there's a bit of random information that comes in in the process that's called minting. That random information then spits out a unique example, a provably unique example of the algorithm that he has never seen before. So the act of collaborating with the collector is part of the birth of the work of art itself. 
So this is fundamental to the way that on-chain generative work, at least at art blocks, exists. So there is a there's a moment of mystery there. So when I'm asking about surprises that he saw, that's the kind of context for that. Because the artist writes the algorithm and knows the general parameters of what can come out of that, but what actually comes out and is minted on the blockchain immutably forever uh, is a mystery. And I, I had no rarities. Yes. I don't build rarities in my art. So it's all meant to be like, I don't want anyone to feel like they got a worse one. I think that's so, so <laughs> silly, yeah. <you know? laughs> Okay, great. And tell us a little bit about this project. Yeah, I'll, I'll be quicker on this one. So this was uh, uh, eight days of tennis. And for the, let's see, what do I want to say? The ATP picked the 300 most interesting shots. What is the ATP? Is the Association of Tennis Professionals. So they have this big, giant thing of data set. <laughs> and... Uh, they went through with uh, some people at something called Tennis Data Viz and the marketing people there, and they picked the 300 most exciting shots. And we took uh, Hawkeye technology, like when they look to see, like, is this ball in or out? So we said, we're going to take that. We're going to use a shadow and determine direction and velocity. And if you go down to the next slide real quick, we built a camera with 114 lenses on it. So any time the ball landed, the algorithm would go through those camera lenses and it's biasing towards a two line image. So if you go back up one, you can see it gets a little bit plain if it's one image. And most of them were like, a lot of them were coming back one image. So we had to build a camera that went up a little bit. And so our idea was basically like we built a, we built a court and code and then we built a camera and then we painted the court with a color and then like a texture on top of it to give it that little bit of movement or same noise that's kind of in squares, but a little different. I love procedural noise. Every designer should. And then down, if we click down one and two, I think we can see some of the output. So yeah, here's three that just show different angles. Again, the, the shadow. If these were live, you can hit A and it kind of animates out and shows you exactly where the the ball was one of the cooler things I saw was people putting like the point next to the piece of art that was like actually, oh, that's an ace. That was championship point or whatever. Somehow it's just like really satisfying to see that's art now. Like, oh, that's a, on a fluorescent pink court. It's cool. I don't know. There's something like really immediate and simple about it. Wonderful. And just for context, also like um, art blocks, when, when we release on what we call like the flagship product, it's, it's art projects made by artists solely of their own initiative and at their own cost of doing that project. But their art blocks technology is also licensed through uh, something called Engine, where we have partners who can commission artists to do projects. And so this is an example where the ATP and Marty came together to do a project that was commissioned using the same technology that these artists would use to, to launch a project on art blocks as an artwork. Yeah, so just, just one's fully on chain, just like a art block script or whatever. Right. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, great. Is there anything else that you want to add, or did you uh, bring any more to this one? There? I brought one more. I think there's two more. Oh, oh maybe no, no, that's, no, that's it. That's yeah, it. perfect. That's my two right projects. on time. Hey. Lots of interesting <laughs> tidbits. Okay, thank you. <laughs> that's amazing. Thank you, Marty. All right, so now let's look at some of Rob's work. Can you talk a little bit? I saw you nodding when he was sort of defining uh, what generative art means to him, but is there anything that you wanted to kind of add about that? Right, yeah, I think that's a, a great start there. And, and just to build off that, I, you know, I do look at generative art as kind of a new tool set for artists um, in the sense of, you know, it, it's not paints and it, it, it's not, you know, pencils, but it's code that lets you kind of express yourself in a different way. And, uh, you know, the challenge being that it's not necessarily just one work you're creating, but you're creating a whole um, output space, a whole design space, not just one design. Um, and you're trying to make it so that the rules that you're defining aren't going to have, I, I mean, the main thing I try to do is not have the bad quote unquote outputs, the broken ones. Um, though at the same time, you try to define that design space so you can have unique things that you didn't anticipate. So that's the challenge, to have some kind of emergence and some unique outputs from this tool set um, without ones that are just, you know, black and <laughs> nothing on them, that kind of stuff. Um, and there have been plenty of 
things like that have, that have come out in different projects. You know, there's just one that's just completely broken and can't be fixed. Um, and so that to me is always, you know, the, the common denominator. Make sure there's pretty much just at least interesting stuff um, and, uh, and stuff that kind of gets your point across, gets the intent across. You talk about um, code as a tool set. I mean, can you talk a little bit about how you learn to use this tool set or how you became introduced to the creative coding or the space? At sure. All? Yeah. yeah. Um, I go back a long way as a software developer. So that's, that's how I started. I've um, been programming since I was like 13 years old um, back in the early days. And uh, I got into games, always had kind of a design sense. So I do web, early web design stuff, um, game development, um, had a game startup in the um, early 2000s, then dot-com bust. And so uh, ended up uh, at Macromedia. Um, the Flash team eventually, and uh, uh, did a lot of sample apps and artwork with Flash. And so that was really, I would say, the start of the creative coding aspect. Um, so I, you know, I was given Flash and Flash Player and said, come up with cool stuff, show examples, you know, push the envelope. Um, here's this new feature. Can you make something beautiful come out of this? Um, and so I have a lot of those old experiments that were just at the time experiments. Um, I didn't take it that far. Um, until I saw Art Blocks again years later, and I first learned about it, I think December 2020, and uh, it all just like I got that right away. Uh, you know, this is like this is the stuff like I used to do. Um, we have definitely found uh, that there are many artists who have projects that they were working on 15 and 20 years ago in another context that are seeing a totally new application for that now um, with these kind of on-chain uh, works. And a lot of these old projects are coming out of the woodwork right. in many different fields, in gaming, in graphic design. We see architects who have, were using the software early on. Yeah. And it's really fascinating to see all this kind of recast and reimagined as art. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, can you tell us a little bit about yes. this project here? Yeah. Sure. So in Spirals was my first project on Artblock. So it was a curated uh, first season, I guess it was called a first series. Um, and it did go back to some stuff I'd been experimenting with. So these start as kind of Escher style tiling of the plane, like repeated tiling of the plane. And then it uses a shader to kind of give it the spiral effect. Um, so really what's happening in these particular ones is you have a flat plane that's tiled completely and basically consider a spiral lens looking at that and you're just moving the plane past the lens of this camera oh, cool. infinitely. Um, so these do animate and they go on as long as you want them to, and you can have them distort. And it, it was one of the first animated ones that, that came out. Um, so yeah, that was, that project was a lot of fun. It kind of drew on, I also have an affinity for kind of comic book art, graphic style. And so, um, that showed up a lot of, in these as well. Um, my, my practice in general, I kind of want to have these things well two things one with generative art i feel you should use the tool set in ways that would be hard to do manually um, like if you have this tool set why not use it to kind of push something new out there that as as a traditional artist you would have a very hard time doing um, and then the other is to have some kind of sense of wonder come out of this like something that's going to you know you're going to go like, wow, or, you know, just space out on for a while or, or something like that, that's kind of taking you to some other level um, and, and hoping to get there. Can, what, what other images did you bring? Can I? Sure. Go yeah. What, so, can I just ask before, as we're switching to this, can you right. talk about what the kind of technical areas that you were pushing in these projects were like, right. how, how do you see them as technically innovative? within the space of right. practice. So for in spirals, it was that kind of first, you know, one of the earliest animated generative works um, and also one of the uh, first to use shaders, actually. Mm -hmm. the, that's a shader that's using that. Um, and with that, I, I did want it to be something that could evolve. So if you can start the animation on your screen and, and set it a certain way, it will just keep changing for a long time. And, uh, you know, it can just be something hanging out there, so. I wanted to have that kind of effect, which is cool. what isn't something I had done before. So that was the push there. Awesome. And tell us about these projects. Yeah. So Eccentrics was a, uh, I decided to go back to the drawing board and, um, and do a, something different. So this actually came out of kind of web design. Um, so Eccentrics, the, the basic algorithm here is that everything's inset a little bit. So it's padding and 
and margins. Um, but it's padding and margins with a lot of randomness going on. And so you start with an outer shape and then you do one that's just a little bit smaller and put it in there. And then next time you might do one that's smaller or you might split it into two different ones and do them. And those might split and then they might come out. And so it was actually a relatively simple algorithm that just started producing these really interesting results um, with different shapes and, and different kind of insets and things going on. Um, and it was when the emergence started mostly when, you, not so much in these, but some of these, like you can kind of see a little face in that one. And then these little eyes started coming out and that became kind of the hallmark of these projects was you know, like the eccentric eyes. I think that's still the, uh, um, the emote on, uh, on the art blocks discord, the eccentric eyes. Um, um, and so some of them, you really could see whole stories in them. You know, there was like three, one that looked like three nuns <laughs> called the, you know, the spooky sisters that people would post. Oh, look at this one. So, so that was a fun part of that project too. Yeah. I think that's also something that's really um, interesting about all this is like, to the one hand, you don't know what the outputs are going to look like. Right. And the other hand, they're immediately released into the wild, in mm -hmm. the public eye. And so there's a very high community aspect uh, of just kind of building conversations around what different people see in these works and all of that, that, you know, there's, there's an opportunity for a kind of one-to-one -one connection between a maker and their audience that this space affords that I think is quite unique. If you're an artist and you have a show and you have an opening, somebody might come up and say something to you at the opening, but they're inevitably going to be polite. And, you know, it's kind of going to be on the level of the platitudes. You right. don't really get like the kind of feedback actually that we see in our discord channel and, mm -hmm. you know, the kind of immediate quick read. And I think that's really part of, I would imagine some of the excitement about, you know, releasing projects in this space. It is. It's actually, as an artist, it gets pretty addictive after a while when you're actually developing these things <laughs> and you're just hitting refresh over and over to see the latest one. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh man, I, you know, or you tweak something. And you're like, this is great, or suddenly this is not good. So, <laughs> go back. Um, but yeah, you can sit there for hours. And uh, I, I remember um, my wife and my kids would be with me sometimes, what, standing behind, and we're all going, ooh, ah, oh, look at that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a discovery process for everyone. Yeah. So I don't know. Did you bring other images? Or yeah, there's a yeah. couple more. So oh, yeah. um, this was project I did after that, taking the same eccentrics algorithm and making a couple decks of cards out of them. So, um, and, you know, kind of leaning into the whole eyes thing, Wonderful. which, uh, which turned out pretty well. And, uh, those should be printed this year. So we'll actually have some playing cards to give out. Or, so cool. So, um, and then my latest project is called wind woven and, and that's on Artblocks engine, um, through the proof, uh, diamond exhibition. So that was uh, selected for the diamond exhibition there. And this is very different, um, but still in the vein of getting the computer to do things that would be super hard to do by hand. Um, so, yeah, you know, Marty had millions of squares going on. These are millions of uh, circles actually um, in these patterns. And when you get close, this is actually looks very tactile, looks very fuzzy. Like you can touch this stuff. Um, uh, and so there is a print in the other room uh, that you can check out just to see what the texture looks like. And so this was a lot of fun to do and to come up with these kind of patterns and textures, um, almost yeah. in a textile kind of feeling, like fiber arts. It's beautiful. I mean, there are so many limits that are part of this process. And uh, one of the requirements actually uh, for releasing on our blocks or on Engine 2, I think, is what we call like resolution agnosticism which means that the works can scale up infinitely. And so it's no, I mean, you, the word million just like rolled off your tongue right there, <laughs> but if we can, if we want to just sit with that for a minute, that can be blown up to any size and hold its resolution because of how the algorithm operates. So that's also something there are kind of unimaginable translations of these things that we haven't even imagined yet that uh, that these algorithms can support and mm -hmm. uh, be output as and prints is one of them although all of them are i would say natively digital yes right wonderful well before i know you didn't bring a slide of this because i'm just springing it on you mm -hmm. now but i did want to just mention the the charity component and the and the the trees and can you just tell oh, us right. a little bit about that because we were so touched at our blocks when that came across our wires oh yeah. sure yeah so um art blocks has actually been really strong 
in encouraging um, and even kind of requiring at one point, but, but mostly encouraging all the artists to give a percentage of the revenues to charity for every project that's, that's dropped. Um, you know, Artblox also does their own thing there. I think there's a carbon offset for every, every time there's a project drop. Um, and so that was a big component. It was in the eccentrics drops. And, um, you know, there was, those sold pretty well and there was a good chunk there to, to give to charity. And so um, I set up actually a foundation called the Radix Earth Foundation. And then we gave a, a pretty large gift to the Save the Redwoods League um, kind of for the local, you know, the, the trees, the sequoias, all the rest. Um, great organization, been around since 1919, I think, was one of the very first environmental charity, charitable organizations in the U.S. Um, back when they, were, they had discovered the sequoia forests and were starting to fell them for lumber. Um, and a bunch of people got together and said, no, not those trees. Um, so still a great group. And um, so we were able to, to do a good donation there. And recently they... Um, thanked us by dedicating a, a redwood grove um, that we we named Art Blocks Grove up in Sonoma. So there's actually a bench there with our names on it in the <laughs> Art Blocks Grove. Um, so if you're ever up in your Occidental, um, you can uh, stop on in and, and hang out. There's a picnic area and stuff like that. So yeah. Well, on behalf of us at Arvalox, thank you. And on behalf of the trees, thank you. And mm -hmm. those people who like clean oxygen and all that. Right. So. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. That's oh, wonderful. Yeah. yeah. All right. And it's a delight to talk to Caroline in this context. I've known her for a little while, and maybe she can say as much or as little about that as she wants. But to be able to introduce her as an artist here and see her work is uh, phenomenal. So let's just turn it over to you and talk a little bit about your background in generative art and what it means to you and how it's informing your practice. Thank you. Yes. Um, so yes, my name is Carolina DeBartolo and um, I'm just getting started <laughs> in this area. So if there's anybody in the audience that's a beginner in, you know, making art for the blockchain technologies, uh, Web3, um, be encouraged by what's going on in my life. I, um, <laughs> I, had, <clears throat> I had a 30 plus year career as a designer and a uh, creative director, uh, design educator. Um, some of my former students are here um, and very appreciative of those people who, who were my former students who showed up today. But um, yeah, so I was kind of a typography lady. Uh, I wrote a book on typography called Explorations in Typography. And I used to work at Artblocks as their uh, director of design and did their rebrand, um, both the Artblocks rebrand and the Artblocks engine rebrand. And um, a few confluence of events happened, which one of which was that my mother got sick and the other one was that I lost my job at, at Artblocks. And um, I started using Midjourney. I had already been using Midjourney to make images. And while sort of sitting visual with my mother, I just was making more and more and more images. You know, there was nothing else to do. I only had my phone. She would wake up and go to sleep and stuff. And so I made a lot of images. I started posting them on social media. Um, and then I was lucky enough to apply to the VCA artist residency. And I uh, am currently uh, one of their, in their sixth cohort of the VCA artist residency. And um, so I'm just feel very lucky to be able to, you know, make more personal artworks. I, you know, have a traditional training in design, but, you know, I went to school in, if you can believe it, I went to school in, in the 1980s <laughs> and um, I had a very traditional training in graphic design, but, you know, I, my first year of college was basically an art background. You know, I mean, we took literally nine hours worth of drawing um, per week in freshman year. And I took painting classes and printmaking classes. And I always wanted to do, you know, my own artwork um, uh, my whole life after I left college. But I never had an apartment <laughs> where I wanted to make a mess also. <laughs> so I never really had a studio. So, you know, Midjourney was so perfect because um, I could do it anywhere. I could do it in the hospital room or, you know, a care facility room, you know, waiting for my mom to wake up or... Um, yeah, so it just there's just this weird confluence of events, and I just had this opportunity to make a lot of art, and now I'm in this residency, and now I can actually I can I feel a little bit justified in calling myself an artist today, <laughs> but I wasn't I didn't feel that way that not that long ago that I felt only that I could call myself a designer. So, 
this uh, series um, that you see there, I call it LA Land. Um, the interesting thing that's happening with Midjourney now is that you can, besides prompt-based uh, commands that you can put into Midjourney, um, you can also feed it your own images. So prior to my mom getting sick, I had already made like 5,000 images in Midjourney. And so I started feeding Midjourney to ask it to make a blend of multiples of my images. And then I also started looking back in my old uh, photography of my um, just things I had taken photographs of. And we took a number of trips uh, for Art Blocks to Marfa, Texas. And I had some images from Marfa that were really inspiring to me. And I started to realize how much Marfa is like such a special place and that it was so inspiring to be there. And so I had, um, these guys have been to Marfa as well. Everybody here has been to Marfa. <laughs> it's kind of a little art blocks thing going on up here, even though I'm not, I'm an excommunicated art block. Um, but in any case, um, I, uh, I found some images of like uh, urban landscapes and I started with feeding the urban landscapes into mid journey and then, you know, layered them in these kind of double exposures and made duotones and so forth. And most of my work uh, has a quality of being kind of vintage. You know, since I do have this traditional training, I'm trying to use this very new tool to make something that looks indistinguishable from something that was made by more traditional means. Because um, that's sort of just where my taste level lives. And, you know, I'm old, so <laughs> why not make something old? I also think that, you know, I used to always tell the students, that, you know, you have, you have basically two options, right? You can do something old in a new way, or you can do something new in an old way. And I think I'm just doing, you know, you can also do something new in a new way, but you might be living in your own little bubble, right, if you do that, right? So, so the idea is to connect to something that has come before. So I think this new technology just allows you to do something old in a new way, I think. And so that's what, what interests me is like something like this, where it kind of looks like it could be a photography or a double exposed photography or some, what did you call it? You called it something, I thought, maybe. <laughs> Acetate. I, I, don't, you know, <laughs> I can't remember half the stuff but, I said. Yeah, so anyway, um, people, people see a lot of things in it. I also, one of my, one of my favorite artists, hopefully you guys might have heard of this person, uh, Giorgio De Chirico. De Chir De Chirico? I'm not sure how you pronounce it exactly. I think it's De Chirico. Um, but in any case, you know, he had these kind of urban spaces with no people. And I just remember so many times always waiting for the person to, that's walking down the street to get out of the way so I can get a great shot with like just the architecture and the, and the little bits of, you know, nature and stuff. So um, the other thing about my work is that it's really eclectic because, you know, I'm using mid journey. So like one day I do watercolors and the next day I do, you can go to the next slide. The next day I do these kind of, um, uh, uh, fictitious, fictitious botanical drawings, you know. So one of the re recurring um, subject matters that I've been doing is dandelions. Um, and I remember being in that freshman drawing class, 1984, 1985 maybe, um, and drawing dandelions. And, you know, it's just been something I've been, you know, attracted to for a long time. And, you know, of course, the dandelion is a little bit like the plant version of a butterfly cocoon and a butterfly right it's like it transforms you know and so I think that it's kind of interesting too that this this subject matter kind of came up at this time in my life when I'm also kind of transforming for myself too so anyway these are also remixes of my own images that I made more traditional kind of um, vintage photography of dandelions and then I kind of remix them so those are the latest ones and uh, also I've partnered or I was accepted to be an artist on this platform called Art Fora. And so what I really think that, you know, unlike these um, digitally native algorithmic generative long form generative art projects that um, Radix and Marty talked about, um, this kind of work to me doesn't really belong on a screen. Like if you wanted to display it in your home or something or in a other location like here at House of Web3, <laughs> that to me something like that, it, just, it should be printed you know, because it, it is, like I say, supposed to be referencing something that is more traditional. So if you go to my room, um, I did I did print out some of my other um, uh, older vintage things printed and framed, you know, kind of finished uh, artworks. Um, so you can see those, but the uh, LA land ones are, uh, I think that's appropriate for a screen actually. <laughs> it looks more like a screen. So. And next one. And so oops, there's a little, should be a little movie playing soon. There we go. So um, as a little kind of um, uh, commemorative item this evening, I made this little series of Ace of Hearts, you know, Hearts for San Francisco and then Ace for like the best, number one, something like that. 
Um, so it's now minting. It's just released at five o'clock today on Foundation. So if you want to get a mint, you can do the QR code. They 50% um, of the proceeds are going to go back to this event that Lisa has so graciously put together for us. So um, it's over there on Foundation, and you can get a little Ace of Hearts for yourself. I think the next one is also about the, or maybe the movie's still playing. But there's 101 of them for the 101 Highway and. I, I called my my business 101 additions too for that reason. But it's also 101 is going back to binary code, you know, zeros and ones. So wonderful. Well, thank you for that introduction, and thank you for <laughs> and and thank you for this uh, this project. Um, so yay! Thank you, Carolina. <laughs> is there? Do you have another slide, or is that? Oh, there's this. Sorry. Okay. You're on the right at the right place if it looks like that, if you're minting. All right, wonderful. Well, I think we have another couple minutes. It, does anybody have any questions for any of our panelists or for myself for the first half here? <laughs> no, no. I mean, I think it matches, but <clears throat> it's like seeing your child for the first time or something. You don't know exactly. It's, I mean, I spent so like going back. I think that project started in 2015. I made my first piece of like, quote, generative art in 2008. I sold my first piece of generative art in 2022. It's a long time to be making art with no one. Nobody cares. You know what I mean? No one, no one's checking anything. And so it's a little emotionally overwhelming to kind of like see this thing happen, regardless of financial success or whatever happened or unsuccess, if that's a word, but uh, you feel connected to that art and that color in a way that I just think it's just like, it's so uh, for me, at least it was like um, hard to appreciate it. I needed time away. And then I think to your point, I'd never, I'd never been on a block talk before. Somebody started sending me stuff. I'm looking at what people are talking about my art. It's crazy. You know, you get all worked up. And then I think you kind of learn to, oh, I like that some people don't like it. I like that not everybody likes it. Or, you know, I don't like the, this one. I don't like number 12 or whatever it is, you know? like. <laughs> and so I think you kind of learn to have like this little friendship with your piece of art. But I think with all, I would bet all artists are people who create anything have a hard time. At least I've heard that a lot. And I think for me, it's true. Like, oh, it's, don't you want to look at it for a little bit? It's a little too hard. You know, the funny thing is, and, and you probably had this happen too, is that sometimes there's one that you don't like as the artist and it came out and somebody minted it, but somebody else out there loves it. And it's like the best one ever. Grail, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and you're like, okay, sure. You know, the one with the one little circle over here. Yeah. <laughs> All right, dude, it's yours. It happened to me too, you know, I was, um, my brother was like, oh, I want to get some of your artwork, you know, here's, here's the ones that I like. And I was like, no, no, I'm not giving you any of those. I'm not, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, I don't like any of them. So. Um, software, I heard you mentioned the journey. I heard you mentioned the actual script. What other software are you using that you have to access it? Yeah, uh, JavaScript primarily these days. Um, processing or? Um, P5 JS for some of them. Um, my latest ones are just pure JavaScript, but yeah, P5 is what you call processing on JavaScript, and that one is by far the most popular. I would say. Yep. Yeah, I like to use I like to use uh, software like he's saying though. Like I uh, I use like RoboFont and things like that in my work because I think it's interesting to start outside of code and then okay, I've done this thing with variable fonts in Glyphs or RoboFont or some other esoteric design software. You're not going to see that show up in a lot of other algorithms or a lot of other people's work. And so I think I love design software. I think it's all so fun. And uh, so starting with some of those pieces and working backwards is fun too. Yeah. Hi. Uh, question for Rob. So you had your and are those closed circles like flourish a lot? So you're um, doing something old and new then? In some ways, yeah. And so the um, with the wind woven one, they're actually um, just the outline of the circle. 
And so that's how the fuzzy texture is coming out. So they're not filled. Uh, and there have been some really good ones, some really good pieces out there already, generative pieces that use the very small circles with very small scales uh, and, and to, to great effect. And so this time, I, I, I had tried it with, I had done it with the, um, the closed circles, the filled circles for a project called the Spring Begins with the First Rainstorm by Cole Sternberg that I worked on. And so we've done some great kind of cloud effects with the closed circles, like millions of them. Uh, and so I just one day said, well, what if I didn't fill those circles? And, oh, it's fuzzy. How mm -hmm. cool. Uh, you know, if you get to a certain point and, and again, kind of close up that design space, that output space to kind of where you, where you want that to be. But, but yeah, the whole thing in the new way. Yeah. yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned many years of teaching. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned Seurat there too, who's a, you know a French post-impressionist painter from the 19th century, and he's somebody that comes up in a lot of conversations with artists that are working in this space. Actually, not only because it's sort of his he is famous for a pointillistic technique, which in some ways kind of um, predicts or presages uh, pixelation, right? It's like uh, they're making a composite image of a lot of small pieces. But it also art historically fits into a moment where painting, which was the dominant image making technology, all until the middle of the 19th century, yeah. was encountering photography, which is the new technology. Mm -hmm. And painting had to sort of kind of wrap itself around what its tasks were and um, how technology and artists would use technology in a productive way. So I think we're at a similar historical moment. We're at an early moment with blockchain and of art that is happening, that is really the use of new technologies that artists who maybe do work for clients in other parts of their identity are using it in non-instrumentalized ways to experiment uh, to find new art ideas. And I think that's really part of the promise of Web3 and of art in this context. And it absolutely lines up with historical debates in painting and painting and its encounter with other new, then new image making technologies. So I know that we're like meant to wrap up this first part, but does somebody have like a very basic question? Does somebody come in here knowing nothing about any of the words that we've used who wants us to define something very basic and get applauded for asking the question that everybody is thinking? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm curious, your definition of generative My definition of generative, wonderful. Well, so one of the first, um, words that came out of Marty's mouth was about systems and about limits. And so I think that's really what we're talking about is, in, is instruction-based art, that you have, a, uh, you have an artist sets up the parameters of a system. They could be as very simple or they could be very complicated. And then something comes into that system that generates an output. So that's how I think of it. I think of it's interchangeable almost Ugh, now I'm like being recorded. I don't know. But it, I, I, the, the word algorithm is in there somewhere, right? Okay. So it's like there's a function that takes an input and, and generates an output. And, and I think randomness is a huge component. Yeah, it's, it's math, but it's not. I mean, I use that word. I just like dropped the word non-instrumentalized. But it uses math kind of against math. In a way, you know, I mean, it uses math to aesthetic purposes, to artistic purposes, not to um, getting something done the way a tool gets something done, but to uh, leading us to a new thought or a new thing to look at. Yep. Yes. Well, now we're going to land right at your feet because you introduced yourself as a beginner, which I don't believe, but <laughs> a beginner. How would you answer that question? Well, no, you were asking about uh, how, what tools to use to tinker. I mean, well, you could use MidJourney, of course, but these guys know more about me by JS. Custom tools. Well, there are, as far as like what I was talking about with blending images, there's, there's these GAN networks, but I mean, I still think you make them on a platform, right, where you can sort of feed, you can kind of train a, a machine learning model on your own images and so forth. I mean, that would be my next step maybe to try something like that, but nevertheless, um, I don't know that you really get away from like making, I don't know, you guys say. Are you talking sort of the AI kind of tools? 
Yeah, so there are ones out there, I don't know the names, but there are ones out there where you can take off 200 images in there. Um, and it will learn training it basically um, from that. And then you can say, okay, this one needs this, and give you two words like that, two or three images. And now you kind of define a new style with that. And then I think I can say, okay, now you use a portrait of a dog, you know, riding on a bicycle. Um, and then it will it'll do that in your style. So, but there are there are some tools that let you. You kind of have to run it on your own machine. Um, I think uh, Sailor Fusion is the one that lets you do that. Um, as opposed to research, which really is pretty much always you send it out to to the search engine. Uh, you're asking me. I you know I <laughs> <laughs> I like I say with with the blend command. I think that you, as far as I can tell, you're not actually you're you're using your own images and you know it can be i think up to maybe four or five images so i've mainly done it with two images because once you get into three and four and five images they start to get into you know just a, a mess <laughs> um probably i don't know i mean i, I that would be the next step i mean I, got, I have my life's work you know already laid out for me here um the rest of my life's work you know just as far as all the images that you can possibly make and all the combinations you can possibly make and you know, the more images you make, the more you say, well, how about if I took that now and combined with this? And the other thing that I do is I make what's called, what I, I call, I shouldn't say what's called, what I call <laughs> a radical. So if anybody's familiar with uh, Chinese language, they have, you know, parts of the, each character is called a radical, right? So you, that's how people who know how to write Chinese <laughs> characters can remember how to write them because they're not all different. There's actually little pieces that are the same, you know, the little radicals inside. And so um, sometimes I use Midjourney just to make radicals that I can, I know I'm, these are not finished works. These are going to be just the parts that I'm going to then blend later, you know, so I work a lot on making like the radicals as well. You know. Wonderful. Yeah. One question in the back. Maybe this will be the last one. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Okay. So the question for those of you who didn't hear is what's the difference between generative and generated art as two terms as they uh, relate to work that is on chain and work that has off chain uh, assets? You guys want to take a stab? Well, I mean, for, for the art blocks model, of course, that is called generative and it's code based. So in the art blocks model, it's actually getting stored on the blockchain the final output. It's the code that will generate the final output. And it's the same piece of code for all you know, 195, all 1,000 pieces, whatever the collection is. Um, what's been stored for each individual piece is the one hash, the, the random value basically that goes into that as the main piece. Um, so in fact, when you're buying an art block piece, you're buying that hash, really. Um, and it just happens to, when it's put through that one collection, it makes a certain output. Generated, I, I think, would be more of the, the curated after the fact. Like the images are created um, by the artist, and however the artist is doing it, and then they're stored not necessarily on the blockchain, maybe on the blockchain based file system, um, but still, that's really more about tying it in with metadata and things like that to the actual image. Uh, and so, what you're buying is ownership of that image, which hopefully will never change, um, but in theory could. It's a little bit different that way, um, and it is a it is a great uh, thing to. Uh, and there are some images that have been encoded on the blockchain, but the images themselves, but they tend to be smaller, you know, and lower resolution than the blockchain. So it's, and, it's a and there are some people who are intentionally putting images those, those that will change, right? But that's the idea of it is that it will change over time, right? So that's kind of an interesting, you know something new in a new way, I guess, <laughs> you know, like whether anybody wants their image to like eventually turn into something else when that's what the image they wanted to buy. But I don't know. So, you know, these are all, these are all questions, but. Yeah. We're all exploring and we'll see where it goes, I guess. <laughs> anyway, well, making artwork is, can be such a, such a private thing and uh, so heartfelt. So 
I know it can feel like you're getting put on the spot to come out and speak about your work. So if everybody could just thank us for their generosity to Carolina and Rob and Marty for talking about their work today. All right, so let's take like two or three minute break if you wanna stretch or grab a thing and come back and we'll reconvene for the second half of our event. All right, thanks folks.
We're going to get started. If you want to find your seats. So we're being mindful of everyone's time. So if you want to come sit down, we're going to start the second half of our evening here. All right. So I've got my cookies on board. Got some sugar in the system. Got some water. We're ready to go. Excellent. Let's okay, do it. Okay, good. So um, this is uh, a, a moment in which we're going to get to know to know each other in real time before an audience. Because uh, one of the fun things about Web3 space is that you can sometimes know people by their pseudonyms or by their screen names, and then you get in real life and you have a whole other dimension of a relationship to have. So we're going to get to know each other um, through this interview format. Um, this is Han, known as Bonafide Han, who you might know by his screen name. And uh, he's here today to talk about an initiative called DECA, a company that he's running, a platform, and also to talk about his life as a collector and um, some work, indicative works in his collection. So uh, he's been generous enough to say that he also would entertain questions maybe towards the end, but I'm imagining just a really informal conversation that we're going to have about what he's been up to and how it relates to uh, generative art in the space. So welcome. Thanks for having me. <laughs> no problem. Do you want to kick it off just by introducing yourself in the manner and tone that you like to introduce yourself? Sure, of course. Okay. Uh, so I noticed the really cool art block stickers and things. So I, I put my my decal, which is the DECA symbol. Um, <laughs> so I'm the uh, founder of DECA. Uh, and then other parts, other things that I do in the NFT space, uh, I'm part of 6029 Capital. And then I, uh, a hobby uh, art collector in, in the space. And uh, certainly by no means, you know, anything compared to these artists who have, you know, spent 14 years, you know, not selling a work for 14 years. I mean, that, that, is, that, is, that is truly something to admire. <laughs> I, I am a, a small collector. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so those are some of the things I do. And uh, I, I, it's going to be exciting to just talk yeah. about some stuff with you. Great. Yeah. So we asked you to put up some slides uh, just to introduce us to DECA and what DECA is. Um, for those who don't know, give us a little introduction, please. Yeah, so, so DECA is a, a pretty cool place. Um, it's a community of people who just love the art that's being created. And uh, we've created both a platform and a place for people to hang out. So uh, here you can kind of see uh, two galleries that have been created in DECA. And that is one of the things that you can do in DECA. Uh, on the left, you see uh, uh, a, what's called a freestyle gallery. And you, as a collector or an admirer of art, can create a gallery that has all the art that you admire, put it down, and it gives you a different kind of you know, context and a way to admire the art that's been created. And on the right is uh, Grant, who is one of the artists in the space. And uh, he's pretty famous, I mean, of course, famous for his art, of course, but uh, also famous for creating these kind of juxt juxtaposition galleries. Well, he'll take his art, and then put often something generative, generative art, next to it to kind of give additional context to his art and the other generative art. And I think they're marvelous. Um, so DECA is one of the, this is one of the ways that you can use DECA. And then if you go to the next slide, uh, two artists that you may be familiar with. Uh, so Radix, you know, you know, I thought, I always thought you were Radix. Yeah, I, I came from computer science with Radix sort, <laughs> but Radix, uh, there's these artist profiles and they're pretty cool. You can look at all of the art that's been created by that artist in a single view. You don't have to go like search on every single platform. You don't have to go look in at the, um, you know, all these links, um, visit the page, see all of the art that's been created by the artist in one single go, and this has been something I, I've, as a collector, really wanted. So uh, we built it. And um, and if you uh, uh, don't don't go to the next slide, but suppose, imagine if you went down, you scroll down, 
you click on a collection, you can see in a really fast way. It's a very fast, uh, well, I'm sure uh, I just jinxed it, but usually it is a fast <laughs> website. <laughs> and if you look at a collection, it's pretty fast. Um, you can also do, um, uh, uh, you know, shrink it down, uh, make it bigger. And uh, the, the Love Tennis Art Project, for example, you can scroll it really quickly by looking at it in a compressed way. Looking, um, it, it's, a, it's a pretty decent experience. So uh, it's, a, it's a good way to get introduced to the artist, follow the artist. Uh, we have a couple new features that are coming out and you definitely want to follow the artist for that. So those are some of the things that uh, Dekka does. Yeah, and I would also just say, we were talking about ger you know, generative art is the overall sort of frame of this. Part of understanding what the artist's intention is, is seeing multiple outputs. So being able to call a project up and see a whole kind of grid of them is another way in to experience the work uh, on a more structural level, maybe then just on an I like this individual output type level. So that's also something that apparently you know, this afford, I mean, this obviously affords this way. And can you talk, so when people talk about like setting up a new platform, I mean, you referenced this just there. You say like, this is something that I wanted to see. Like, can we talk a little bit about like what problems this solves? Like, I, like what, it, yeah, maybe just I'll leave it at that. Totally. So, um, so a little bit about my background coming into this space. So I, uh, I liked beautiful things. But I, I wasn't like an, an art collector, right? Uh, and I still don't think of myself as an art collector, but just, just uh, um, but I entered the space by, by collecting a bunch of the art that, that was created, especially in art blocks. And uh, I mean, really, art blocks is kind of the foundation of a lot of the things that we, the entire space has been built on top of. And uh, so I, I came into the space as a collector and the space is new. It's a it's a very new space. And uh, I mean, the 721 um, um, uh, protocol. Proto uh, e sorry. Right. So ERC ERC 721. The proposal well, it came out in 2020, I believe. 2021. I mean, it, it, it it's a it's a new movement. So I came into the space as a collector. And I found a lot of, you know, warts and things that I wanted to fix. Uh, starting with a way to have a gallery, a freestyle gallery that, that would uh, unbind me from all of these ways that, that you can only show in a single row. And, and I wanted to have a freestyle gallery. So I, we built a freestyle gallery and that's what we started with. Um, uh, I, I wanted to have, a, you know, all the art that I collected, all the art that I really enjoyed, I wanted to see it on my phone. So we built uh, uh, an app. Uh, we haven't really focused on the app. The app's kind of broken, so. <laughs> we, we're working on other things. Uh, other things that are a little bit better than the app. Um, um, but yeah, that, that's how we started. Then recently we built uh, the artist profiles because I personally got tired of clicking through all 20 links on a link tree uh, on every single artist profile. Um, usually I got lost after the third link and trying to figure out which link I'd clicked and not clicked. And, um, and so I, I wanted a, a single artist profile. Um, and uh, a lot of these artists are my friends too. So it's like, hey, what do you, what do you want us to build? And it's, they're like, build us this thing. I was like, let's do it. And uh, so that's how we got to build this thing. Um, and, and honestly, I, a lot of the pro platforms out there are slow. Uh, so one of the fast things, well, one of the things that we really wanted to focus on was, at least for the artist profile and the experience that you have on it, super fast. Um, not as fast as I want it yet, but, but fa much faster than much, many of the other platforms that you see. And so uh, an art first platform that really focuses on um, artists and uh, being able to see their art, experience it. Uh, the way that I kind of think about DECA is like, we're building out the infrastructure for, for us to experience digital objects. Um, uh, if, if you're new to the space, the really cool thing about the, the concept of an NFT, and I've talked about this before, but I'll, I'll do it again, um, is uh, so, 
it's the, it's the first time in history we as a civilization have created digital objects that are the property of object permanence. So what is object permanence? It's the idea, so take this table, you know, take, take this steel beam or whatever it's made of. It's a, it's a property of the physical world and we take it for granted that as long as the you know, thing doesn't corrode, it's not destroyed, a um, hundred years later, it will still be there. And that's the property of, of physics. Uh, these atoms don't get destroyed and they're here. Uh, digital objects, they did not have this property until recently. Mm -hmm. It's only through the physics of decentralization that we have digital objects that have object permanence. That's crazy, actually. I mean, for me, that's crazy. And the fact that these objects are Turing complete and you can do anything with them, which means that you can build um, anything and everything. So we are just scratching the surface of what these things are. All the things that you think about, uh, think about, you know, think about the domain name, right? Amazon.com. That's a, that's a pre-NFT NFT. Uh, that itself is built on a decentralization system, custom built for the internet. But the concept of the NFT makes a generalized system that enables you to create anything like a domain name, and that'll just be one sliver of it. So we're gonna be creating this mirror world of digital objects that do everything and everything, and it's gonna be as big and interesting as the physical world. So uh, the way that I think about DECA is that we think about DECA as the infrastructure to experience these digital objects. So with physical objects, we, we have been through evolution with you know, hundreds of millions of years of evolution, uh, have capabilities to sense the physical world. With these digital objects, they are uh, right now immaterial. Um, and so we're gonna build out the infrastructure for experiencing them. And uh, that's, the, that's the way we kind of think about our mission. You got me convinced. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thank no, you. I, I would just note here that, you know, I, again, I, I come from a background in history. So I was trying to like locate these things in cycles of history that we understand and, or to make, help me understand. And I think of, you know, art is almost always been the leading edge of something new that then has unforeseen applications because artists are experimenting and they're based, again, goes back to the non-instrumentalized aspect. There are ways in which artists can, um, can try new things without a client or without um, a, a necessary useful purpose that enables us to learn about being in the world in, in new ways. And I think when you're talking about this, I'm not at all surprised that the first use case is to try to figure out how best to present um, natively digital artworks. And, uh, but I can see when I hear you talk and I become more and more convinced that this has eventual applications that really maybe can exit, you know, have nothing to do with art, but um, art is the, is the first use case for this, I guess. Oh, it, it is, it is going to be a remarkable use case. Yes. And uh, I think, you know, we sometimes, uh, as a society, downplay art as in it, it's something that's, you know, that's not useful or something like that. But to them, I always tell them, I mean, really, it, art and, and these, and what I call these cultural objects are, they, they are sometimes the only things that last after a civilization dies, <laughs> you know? <laughs> the art that's been produced by a society that's often the last remnant of that society. And so uh, to those who question, you know, whether art is just a, you know, a simple application of this thing, um, I, think, I think it's a marvelous application. Um, the, the thing that's also really cool about this, this whole thing is that, you know, these digital objects, they're also eternal. As long as the blockchain exists, they are eternal objects, which is, which is insane. Um, because we have always tried to create eternal things, you know, whether it's governments, whether it's nations, corporations, families, you know, lineage, et cetera. We've always strived for the eternal and this thing has created it. So uh, 
being able to create art that's eternal, uh, that will survive, you know, us, maybe even the countries we live in. Um, I think I think it's really cool. Wow, and that eternal aspect actually uh, links back to the question about the difference between generative and generated that came up earlier, and if I just want to maybe try to close that loop. So the what Rob was saying about the code being on chain and the hash being the thing that can always call the code up, that is very crucial to the idea of it being immutable, not changeable, and eternal, because as long as the blockchain exists, that thing and the software exists to interpret the thing that's on the blockchain, you will get the artwork, you will see the output, you will it will be recalled. Whereas something that's generated, that has an NFT that points to it that's somewhere else, is only there as long as that person wants to host that thing. And when that company goes out of business, or that person gets sick of paying their utility bills, or they unplug their computer, you have the deed to a house that doesn't exist. And so that is the difference between something that's on-chain and generated that participates in this conversation about forever and about immutability um, that I think is the most exciting part of the space, um, if speaking from my seat. All right, did you bring, what, what do we have next? We have this. Does this tell us to do something? Uh, I wanted to introduce the, 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 the Decagon as an example. So if okay. you play the video. I, so, did, I didn't do that, but it did. Ah, okay, very cool. thank you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> so the, the Decagon is a piece of art created by Gulid. Uh, I'm sure you know Gulid from, I mean, many of you may know Gulid from Archetypes. So um, if you could play it again and pause it at uh, there. Thank you. So uh, that image, oh, by the way, just a, a token detail page of a token. So, so that is a, a piece of art. Um, that's the, what's interesting about this is that the, the art evolves. So it's not that uh, you had a piece of art and uh, you know, it, it never changes. Uh, we have a concept of like what we call a, a, a DXP. It's like an XP thing. Uh, it's like a point. You can earn points inside of the system, and uh, uh, you just have fun with it by by doing little quizzes on art, which is which is I think pretty cool. <laughs> but um, you earn these points, and you can apply it to this NFT, and the NFT grows. So if you could uh, press play again. And then pause it. Oh, okay. Uh, go back a little bit. Pause. Thank you. So, so that NFT that you see in the background. So that's the NFT that grew up out of this initial very simple NFT. So, uh, what's cool about this this concept of the Decagon is that you know. A lot of the art that is being created, uh, they're non-interactive, or they, they don't grow, or they're they're static. Uh, as I mentioned before, the the concept of the the NFT, the the remarkable thing about that is is that it's Turing complete. So it's, it it just means in computer science that it's a it's written in a in a programming language that can basically do anything. And uh, here it's an example of an, an NFT that can grow. So you can, just like a Tamagotchi, you know, that I'm sure I'm dating myself, but just like a Tamagotchi, you can kind of grow the thing. And it's like a little piece of art that you own that you grow in. And, and you don't actually know what it's going to turn into, which is the other cool part. And um, so, yeah, if, uh, if you want to try minting a Decagon, you can go to deca.art slash Decagon and mint it. Um, and uh, and then grow it. So it's pretty cool. I, I, I ended up owning like 80 of these. <laughs> they're, they're just so fun. <laughs> cool. And let's see what this next one is. Okay. So maybe now I'm switching gears a little bit to talking about your life as a collector. I mean, just, you know, you say I'm not an art collector, but I'm going to say... I call that art, and if you own it, you collect it. So we call you an art collector. That's fair. <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about your journey in in collecting this kind of art, and and what has most interested you, and 
maybe even how to get started for people who, you know, are coming in and maybe getting their first piece next week or yeah. Tell us a little bit about your story as a collector. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I entered the space as, as a, a hobbyist and somebody told me, Hey, go look at this thing called NFTs. And I was like, oh, what, what are NFTs? And, uh, and they said, just go look at some stuff. And they told me to look at a punk and uh, punks at that time were not as expensive they are now. And I was like, okay, I'll, I'll just buy a punk. Cause like the best way to learn something is just own it and just start doing stuff with it. And the first thing you could do with an NFT is, is of course buy it. So bought a punk, bought an ape, and then, and then I discovered something called Artplux. Before you did that, you bought cryptocurrency though. Ah, uh, yes, I did, I did. How did you do that? When did you set up your <laughs> wallet? How did you know about that? So, um, so I was a casual owner of crypto pretty early on, um, uh, but I never really got into crypto. And that's the, that's the funny thing. This story is kind of a template of a lot of stories of people who got into crypto. You, they, they got pulled into crypto. Somebody said crypto is cool. Okay, cool. I just bought some coins, et cetera. And I just sat in Coinbase for like five years or something. Um, that's usually how it turns out. And then, hey, you know, I got into NFTs and that's when I got really into crypto. And so that was the exact same thing. I just had a couple of stuff and, and um, I forgot about it. I mean, price went up, et cetera, but kind of boring. Um, and then I got into NFTs, and that's that's the when I got really exciting, yeah. And then uh, so with with our blocks, uh, it was uh, I'm sure you've seen DC Investor, a very prolific tweet tweeting guy. Uh, I don't know how he has time for anything else but tweeting, but he tweets a lot. Um, <laughs> and uh, he mentioned, hey, go look at this thing called Fidenza, um, and that was like three days or two days after Mint of the Fidenza series. So I went and looked at Fidenza and um, I liked it. So it's, it's also kind of very addictive, you know? It, <laughs> I bought one, I bought another one and I just kept going until I, uh, at that time I owned 56 of them. So I bought 56 Fidenzas um, in the beginning and um, I just fell in love with how how I could create sets of them. So I actually have a, a set of these, uh, what are called micros, and they're green micros. And I, there, there's only four of them in the entire collection of 999. And I labeled it uh, wind through grass. And when you print it at 40 by 48 inches and put four of them side by side, they actually look like, you actually feel the wind going through the grass and the um, so that's how I got into collecting uh, by creating sets of fidenzas and uh, yeah yeah so this is really interesting because um, you're describing coming to it after the project has minted already so this is there there is a moment there where you see everything that the algorithm can release like the algorithm has been written it's been loaded on chain. The algorithm has been seeded 999 times. It's created 999 individual outputs that the artist could not imagine ahead of time, that the collector could not imagine ahead of time. And then in that kind of one day, two day period right after that, there's a, usually a rash of turnover of ownership of those things. As people begin to understand what the algorithm has done, the artists can see it for the first time and the collectors can see it for the first time. And they can start to sort of manifest their own sensibility by, I would say, cherry picking um, works that have minted out. And so what you're describing is you went into this with this lens of I like micro, you, you identified traits that you liked and were able to go into the secondary market and then assemble a collection um, based on those. Do we? Is there an image of that or... Or no, this is a different project, but there isn't. Yeah, I would just say that um, that's that. It's not just the minting that's the fun part. I mean, part of it is also like going back and you know seeing what the algorithm has wrought and making collections for yourself of that. And I want to ask this question. I'll, I'll the resonant dumb question. Okay, so 
dumb questioner. So in DECA, you don't have to own those works to put them in the gallery, right? That's correct. Okay, right. So you could essentially curate your own collection of works that you don't even need to own just to be able to see them and enjoy them in that way, right? Exactly. And that's one of the reasons that we started with building that kind of gallery is because people wanted to kind of lay out, you know, their ideal collection or ways to compare, you know, I love, you know, you know, you know, I love fermented fruit and you would, you know, put it side by side, describe all the traits and like explore it and you become a curator. So like a lot of the, the functions of uh, what we call like trad art, we kind of just replicated it sometimes without even knowing about it. Uh, and definitely without permission. <laughs> definitely without permission, <laughs> which is the best part. And um, um, and so you know, we we didn't ascribe these like you know very very you know fundamental things like we never called ourselves curators, but essentially that's what we're doing. And uh, you know, a lot a lot of the market clearing functions of a gallerist or um, the the go to market engine of you know basically selling the art. Uh, a lot of us became art dealers. Uh, so, for example, like right after I bought like 56 Finanzas, uh, for about a month or two, for about two to three months, I became like the the guy who sold Fidenzas. <laughs> <laughs> so if you wanted to buy a Fidenza or if you wanted to sell a Fidenza, a lot of people just came to me and I became like a central market clearing function. Um, and so I, I moved quite a bit of inventory, in, <laughs> and and of course for you know for zero commission. But it was it was just like it's fun. I want I want to help, and uh, all, all these roles that you would have, and you know I, I'm the Guggenheim, and you know I'm the you know this this gallery that that sells this thing, and I'm a museum that you know canonizes art. All these categories that have been established, you know, ever since the the concept of uh, the public museum. Uh, I, I forgot uh, there was a some museum in England, and then the the public museum, national museum that was first created. Uh, you know, the Louvre. These roles and systems that have been created since the 1800s. You know, we kind of recreated it in like six months, and we kind of just had a lot of fun and. The, 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 the days of 2021, they're really fun. They're really fun. Well, I say that as kind of a joke that you do it without permission, but I think that's actually an important part of this. I mean, part of the, the ethos of decentralization is actually about breaking down boundaries between um, specific roles and responsibilities. I think that a lot of what brings us, some of us to this space is the idea of not having to ask permission to be a curator not having to ask permission to be a, a collector, not having to ask permission to be an art dealer, not having to ask permission to be an artist. All of these things are what this space affords, I think. And so I think that, you know, we're in uh, a, a time when the traditional art world is, I think, having to sort of like adjust in a certain sense. We're not quite there yet, but I think that what we're seeing in this space will actually go back and change that system. In, in a certain point. And of course, one of the, the major attractions for artists of this space is the idea of not splitting 50% of your sale with your gallery, which is how the art, traditional art world functions. And um, most of these platforms have heavy majority um, of the proceeds going directly to the artist. And then also uh, they can benefit from resale royalties if they are enforced. All right, so can I just go to the next slide? Because I see that we went from Fidenza and then uh, you went to another project for Tyler's. Yes, uh, one thing I just wanted to add to the, the permissionless, yeah, I thank you also for like emphasizing these points because you know I've been in the space long enough that I kind of like skip over a lot of stuff and directly go into terminology that I'm sure is very degen and, and stuff like that. And, uh, <laughs> By the way, degen is for like degenerate. There you go. <laughs> <You're very nice. laughs> well done. But uh, but the permissionless part is really, I think, I I I really couldn't agree more with it. I think uh, not not even just the art portion, but all of crypto, like the revolutionary fire of crypto, is like to invert uh, centralized systems. Like our, our society is built on top of centralized systems, and uh, usually they turn out to be opaque and eventually corrupt. Um, and so. 
uh, the revolutionary fire in crypto is open everything up, make everything transparent, and nobody can be permit, uh, prevented from doing anything inside of the rules of the system. And so um, uh, I think, uh, I think in, a, in some matter of time, I don't know what the time unit is, but in some matter of time, I think it will be often sometimes you know, crazy. That they, they will say, it's kind of crazy you guys relied on a piece of paper that said it did something and you just trusted that it did something as opposed to a program or math that actually ensured that it did something. So um, I think as a society, we are in the transition period where these concepts are new uh, and it's only later uh, some amount of time passes and, and everything I think will transition to this kind of system. We're in the future. Yeah. All right, great. <laughs> Tell us about this. <clears throat> um, by the way, I'm, I'm actually not trying to just focus on Tyler's works. Uh, it's just that I have a lot of them. So I was asked to pick four or five of them. And so I just picked one from each of the categories that I own. So that, that's why the Tyler is two of the representative uh, pieces of art. Um, and I should, I should really get back to collecting. I've, I've really focused on DECA for the past like year and a half. I should get back to collecting. We'll welcome you back. Definitely, thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, I see Incomplete Control was the project that immediately followed Fidenza by Tyler Hobbs. And um, uh, it was, it was a, a really interesting project because a lot of the um, digital art that had been created until that moment, um, I, I surely shouldn't say all because I don't know if, if that's true. But a lot of the art that I had seen before that moment um, often tried to express uh, digital perfectionism. So the way, and definitely take a, a look at some of Tyler's es essays, he really kind of lays out in cogent written form a lot of the stuff that I'm kind of bumbling around, but uh, <laughs> much better to read his essays. Um, but the fact that he created um, so if, if I look at Fidenza, it's kind of like perfected digital abstraction and, and not saying it's like the best, but it's just one kind of like, he tried to perfect digital abstract, uh, 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 like these little shapes. The opposite of it was incomplete control. So they go uh, in pairs. So incomplete control was this attempt to kind of make it as uh, um, not controlled as possible. So he talks about how in digital art, you have, uh, you can create perfect things. You can create a perfect circle. You can create the perfect line. And the reality is that most of the physical processes that create art, they're all created with stochastic systems that have, ran have random distributions of how, let's say a pigment is applied to the paper, how a line is drawn by a pencil. They're all stochastic systems that follow a distribution and uh, randomness of nature adds little imperfections. And so incomplete control was the digital uh, representation of that. Instead of perfection, he tried to create um, in a some rule set, create imperfection. And so let the control go and see what happens. And so it produces um, these pieces of art, very different from Fidenza. I think of Fidenza as like fruit, and I think of incomplete control as a like wine. And uh, often the, um, just as Caroline said, often, um, at least for IC, the best way to uh, experience IC is to uh, see it in person. So like, it's a 40 by 50 print, they're huge. And if you, you know, encase it in museum quality glass or uh, museum quality often acrylic, uh, it, it really is something to behold. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of looks like little scribbles. And of course they are scribbles, <laughs> but really interesting to see when printed, 
uh, and in the right presentation format, something crazy. And did he um, specify those output parameters of the size and how this should be framed, or were you in conversation with him about that? Uh, these are all random. Yeah. So uh, it was a really cool event where like, we all gathered in a single spot, minted it together physically, actually. Yeah. And uh, it was really fun in New York. Amazing. OK, what's next? So uh, I just wanted to show another example of a decagon. Um, this is like an example of a decagon that grows from just a simple template, just a 2D template, just little line drawings, and you keep feeding it DXP, and it grows into this like beautiful abstract kind of rendering. And uh, uh, they're they're really beautiful pieces. Um, uh, and a lot of the the committee members in in Deca, they they lo love to like grow the thing and <laughs> see what it turns into. And some of them are they're truly beautiful. And this is one of them that I really appreciate. Uh, here's a here's a what we call a, a decal. So the the decal is our symbol, uh, our logo for uh, for Deca. And we have this whole program where artists will create these decals in the rendition. Uh, so they'll render the decal. Um, you know, lots of artists have done it. Familiar names like you know X Copy, you know Grant uh, Gould's done one. Um, but lots of artists that you know, or if you are in the space, have done it. And they'll kind of like do different, imagine it differently. They'll. This one is done by actually a team member in 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 Dhaka, and it's. It, it looks like a photograph, but it's not a photograph, and it has a decal. Uh, you can you can ignore the fake but rare. It's it's another degen terminology that <laughs> that'll take some time to describe. <laughs> the space has um, um, the space is interesting. Uh, I think of crypto as like it, the crypto market and culture is like ten x faster than anything else I've seen, and. Especially in 2021, the NFT culture was at least like you know five times faster than crypto, and this culture, the, the you know, when, whenever you have this kind of like island of people that are tightly bound, they often create their own culture, and uh, and you create your own phrases and you know little you know you know pieces of language that that are you know inside language that is used by the culture. That's what that's what we mean by a lot of like degen things and and faker but rare is one of those idioms in in our culture that, uh, yeah, I, I could explain it, but <laughs> <laughs> exactly, good more is another one. Yeah. So sorry, if the just if this is not a photograph, what are we looking at? Uh, I think he modified it just using Photoshop, actually. Mm. So he it's a photograph. But the decal was added. I got it. And then okay. the the fake but rare was added as well. Very nice. Wonderful. Tell us about this. Ah, so this is another example of an NFT that goes beyond an NFT. So this is a, a piece of art that uh, we created in conjunction with Matt Cain. So um, the, the chain is a place where you can write anything. So when you look at a block, that block space, uh, you compete for it, and there's a market for it, and that's that's what you know. Cut, what that's what gas is. The gas needed to participate, be a part of that block. Uh, that block, you can write anything, right? So, uh, very famously, uh, the first block, um, there were the words from the uh, the Times of London uh, in 2008 or 2009, 2008, I believe. Uh, the the exchequer of uh, something says that banks will are insolvent or something like that. Banks are insolvent, and then that was also a statement by. I mean, I think Satoshi wrote the first block, or he was part of uh, writing it. Um, so you can write anything in the block, and the words from the headline of two, some day in two thousand eight was written in the first block of Bitcoin. So we kind of took inspiration from that, and we said, why don't we create a system where you can write down any words, and it'll be persisted, 
and the words will be used to create art that's beautiful and it could accompany the words. And so that's an example of an NFT that goes beyond an NFT that, uh, you know, it's static, et cetera. It, it also evolves as you, you can create copies of it and it evolves. So I just wanted to use that as an example. Super cool. So it takes a textual prompt? It takes in, so those words, the donut that started it all, that, that phrase, uh, a, you, somebody wrote that down and then uh, they co-created it. So that was used as a seed and from it, uh, you can edit it and then say that you would like it. You persist it. Oh, great. Yeah. Cool. All right. So are those our visuals? That was it. All right. Wonderful. Well, thank you for that presentation and for walking us through your journey as a collector. And yeah, um, I could monopolize this airtime all night, but I don't want to do that. So can we open up the floor if anybody has any questions or thoughts or comments? Please. So we are trying to create a lot of the infrastructure that that you would like in the whole ecosystem. Uh, gallery is, a gallery is one of the things that that we're trying to do, uh, and uh, it's it's a it's a live system. You can go to Decca.art, sign up, create galleries, create an account, start following artists. Um, uh, I didn't completely understand the question about the, the block space. Oh, uh, yeah. well, that was more complicated. Just the, the amazing ability of the, uh, well, on, on the Ethereum blockchain, you, you can have a, a 50 megabyte file, mm. uh, and that's the impermanence that is there forever. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Exactly. Oh yes, yes, exactly, exactly. So um, we are, so we've built the, the gallery part, which was intended to kind of like be a, a, a way to like self-express like all the things that you want to do. We built the artist profile, and then the next thing that we'll build is this very slick uh, collector profile, which will be coming pretty soon. So yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you, by the way. Uh, so DECA, this was a, a holdover name from a previous incarnation of a startup that I was doing. So I was building a startup uh, that was completely unrelated to NFTs. And then I got into NFTs and it turned out I was like spending no time on my startup and <laughs> all the time on NFTs. And so I pivoted the startup, which was the only thing I could do at that point. Um, so it was called DECA at that point because of the scientific prefix notation of 10. It's supposed to like 10x uh, certain things. But it turned out to be a really good name because it's very short, memorable, has uh, really hard consonants. And so, um, and not many companies use that. So I don't know why, I think it's a good name. <laughs> Great question. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, totally. So, um, uh, so before I did DECA, I was 
uh, definitely working at all the familiar names in technology. And uh, all the things I'd learned carried over there. So um, certainly uh, performance is a end-to-end uh, -end stack phenomenon. So uh, if your database query sucks then and you've laid out your data incorrectly, then it won't be fast, for example. Or if your image caching is bad, then then your your cache hit rate won't be good. So it, it's a it, it's a holistic choice organizationally to say that we are going to optimize something that is sometimes invisible. Uh, so that is one of the choices I think you have to make as an organization. And then um, in terms of like the tech stack, yeah, we do the very standard things: Next.js. TypeScript uh, using uh, MySQL uh, related um, stuff, but uh, but it, it really is a fine-tuned focus organizationally to say that speed matters and we're going to slow things, the other things down in order to achieve speed because speed has a cost, not in terms of, not only in terms of just building it first time, but a maintenance cost because every single time you do something, all the metrics go down uh, because it introduces another row, which corrupts the indexing performance. And you're like, oh, we got to do this again. And it means that it's going to slow down that uh, feature development. So it certainly has to be something you choose to do. And you choose to do again and again for eternity. So uh, it's, um, uh, but I will say that, you know, it, it is pretty fast, but there are things that we need to do that will make it even faster. Uh, and uh, once we have that piece in place, I think it will actually be just like incredibly fast to the point where it's like, I don't know how you guys do it kind of thing. And that's where I want to get to. I can still see some points of stutter and certain infrastructure choices we have made that don't get there. So uh, stay tuned, soon it'll be faster. <laughs> So, um, well, uh, cer certainly speed of light plus some epsilon. <laughs> <laughs> so like the RTT between the client to the server times two uh, plus some epsilon for like, you know, servers responding, et cetera. Oh my God, I've never heard that sentence before. So what's amazing about this is that we're having uh, Specialist conversations are coming together between uh, science and art in the interdisciplinary workspace here, friendly space uh, that welcomes all. Uh, I have no idea what you just said, but it sounds awesome. <laughs> so um, anyway, thank you all for coming. Maybe I'll hand it over to Lisa just to wrap it up tonight. But thank you, Han, for your generosity. You all right. Thank you. Um, Jordan, and thank you, Han, and thank you for DECA. I just had to also say, um, I absolutely love it. And for me to be able to collect a DECAGON, and you all can go on the platform and collect one um, from, I, I was admiring that artist forever, and I was priced out. And so it's so accessible, it's so amazing, and it's so fun to upgrade your DECAGON. So definitely get on there. And then plus, as a a collector to be able to view everything. And then the artist profiles, I, I've heard artists just rave about how great it is to be able to view all of their collections in one. So anyway, just wanted to shout out De Deca. And thank you for being here. And thank you, Jordan, amazing uh, talk tonight and all of the artists, um, Martin, Rob, and Carolina. And then we also have exhibiting artists that again, I want you to check out. Um, check out the guide and all the different rooms. We have Santiago and Jeff Palmer and Johan, as well as um, we have some resident artists that are also on display, Sanchuk, Kyle Gordon, Stephen Wallace, Superfray, and Pixel Activist. And then also Paul Rossoni um, is an artist whose physical art is all over the space and collection. So definitely check that out. And I wanted to thank uh, um, our sponsor again, for, um, sorry, Clars for sponsoring the evening and then also the House of Web3. This is an awesome event and thank you all for coming. Check out the interactive stations in the front, collect a POAP, thank you.